Okay, I think I will uh, start. I hope that no more people are coming. Or, well, of course I hope they're coming, but then they're a bit late. <laughs> Um, yeah, so unfortunately I didn't finish entirely uh, last time the, the height function part. So I'm going to quickly recall what we proved and how to finish uh, the proof. Fortunately, if this is the first time you come, then it's a bit hard to follow, but yeah, that's inevitable. Um, so we work on the hexagonal lattice. We have some inverse temperature and we sample a height function according to this law where we only look at height functions whose support is contained in lambda. Lambda is a domain. And the probability of each height, each height function is proportional to e to the minus beta times the height differences squared. OK? And we spent a lot of time to prove, we want to prove that you have delocalization when beta is very small. So there's this beta, which kind of forces neighbors to be close together. But when they're not so much forced, we want to show that, in fact, when the domain is big, the thing goes far away from zero, right? Um, yeah, so if you have a, high do a large domain, then if you look here, typically the value is not going to be small. Um, so to do that, we first prove that, in fact, if you localize, so if uh, the variance remains bounded, then the thing converges uh, locally to some limit mu. So it means you can kind of push boundary conditions to infinity. And this mu has all the nice properties that you can wish for. So it's ergodic. It has all the symmetries of the hexagonal lattice. Uh, it has the FKG inequality. And it has flip symmetry. So flip symmetry means that if you multiply the height function by minus 1, of course, the symmetry is preserved in this procedure. Um, so first, what we, what we did was basically, I mean, we know that there should be a phase transition, right? So for beta large, we know it's localized, and we want to show that for beta small, it's delocalized. Um, but in this first analysis, we really look at all beta. So in particular, in, the, in this first part of the analysis, what we do is really true for all beta. And we prove that um, h greater or equal than 0 percolates. We prove that h less or equal than 0 percolates. But if you replace the greater or equal or less or equal by strict, then you lose the percolation. Okay? And what it means in this picture, of course, this graph is a planar graph. So somehow this, these uh, observations have to yeah, respect the planarity. And it means that somehow you have these yellow and red clusters, but they're finite. But if you take only the red clusters and you add the white, then suddenly they percolate. And, well, I said many times that the key ingredient to all these proofs is this phase coexistence uh, theorem, and which relies on the planarity. So kind of the, what really illustrates these zeros is that you have these kind of points where you have two red clusters which come together, but they don't meet because there's a white in between. And similarly, you have the yellow cluster which kind of meets, right? So you can really kind of think of these white uh, vertices as the crossroads where yeah, the two competing clusters are allowed to cross. Right. So to explain, basically, to we, well, there's a phase transition. So for small beta, we're going to see that, in fact, you delocalize. Right? So there's a contradiction. And where does the contradiction come from? Well, in some sense, those two sets are very similar to each other. Right? They're almost the same set. If we can change our strategy such that those two sets are the same, then we have a contradiction because, okay, here we say it percolates and here it doesn't percolate, right? So if it's the same set, there's clearly contradiction. But obviously we need to change a bit our strategy to make that happen. Um, and let us also quickly recall how we prove this. So why does this not percolate? Well, suppose this set percolates, then this set also percolates, right? Because it's completely symmetric. But then you have two competing sets. I mean, they cannot use the same vertices, right? So they have two competing sets which percolate, but this is impossible by this phase coexistence theorem. Okay? So this is a phase non coexistence. 
Okay, that's the first part. So then we looked at the second part. So why does this set percolate? Okay, so I'll quickly recall the proof. Um, well, suppose it does not percolate. Okay, rather actually let's look at this set because I like it more. Uh, yeah. So suppose that this set does not percolate. Then it means that if I explore from very far, so I kind of, I start an exploration outside of a large box. And I really, I try to explore this cluster, which is hitting the boundary, right? So it means that I follow red, but we're looking at less or equal than zero, so I also find some white bits. So it maybe looks something like this. But I chose some kind of target vertex X. And because the set doesn't percolate, if I start far enough, then very likely I will find that this expiration is kind of stopped when I hit a yellow cluster, right? Because it doesn't percolate, so it means that the complement this is greater or equal than one. Okay. So now I consider the law at this point. So now what do we know at this point? If I look at hx uh, minus 1, okay? And I want to compare this to the law, well actually, okay, let's do it like this. I want to compare this to the law of hx minus 1. So I claim that in fact in this measure I'm going to have this stochastic domination. Why is that true? Well, if I found my boundary conditions which are greater or equal than 1, then if I subtract 1 from the boundary conditions, they're kind of greater or equal than 0. So it means that this height function has boundary conditions which are greater or equal than 0. Well, if your boundary conditions are greater or equal than 0, then you're more likely to have a positive deviation than to have a negative deviation. Okay, so on the left, this, uh, this is of course the same as uh, minus hx plus 1. But in the original measure, I'm also flip symmetric, right? I'm flip symmetric around 0 because everything I did was flip symmetric around 0. And therefore, this has the same distribution as hx plus 1. So what am I saying here? I'm saying hx plus 1 is stochastically dominated by hx minus 1, which is clearly a contradiction. Okay. So this is, this is why this set doesn't work. Okay, so basically what do we do now? We say um, if beta is sufficiently small, then I can adapt this strategy to prove that I have a set which simultaneously percolates and doesn't percolate or I derive the contradiction somewhere else, but basically we're going to do the same strategy. Okay, so let's focus on this function. Okay, I can write this as a function uh, which kind of depends on the height difference. I call this A. And, okay, so here this is A, zero. By the way, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, just ask. I'm not so good at plotting graphs in my head, but I hope you can forgive me. So basically what we want to say is that um, these, zero ver these, these zero sides, they're clearly a bit annoying, right? I mean, they're not being nice to us. And we kind of want to change what those zero sides are doing. So actually we want to say, well, it's kind of like a zero side, but you know, maybe it's not really like a zero side. Maybe it actually chooses a preference. I mean, if we can toss a coin for those white sides and they become red or yellow, then, well, they cannot allow both to go through, right? So it turns out that when beta is small enough, you can find a way to toss the coin, which 
makes this procedure happen. And basically there are two ingredients. The first ingredient is the fact that we are cubic, that the maximum degree is three. And the second ingredient is gonna be that beta is small. So I'll now explain how it works. Um, okay, we have this weight associated to each edge, right? Because the probability of a height function is gonna be the product of this thing where I put the height difference, squared. Um, yeah, of course it should be squared, yeah. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write this function in a different way. So I'm gonna split the weight at zero into two bits. So these are kind of uh, two bits of equal, uh, equal size. And what I'm gonna say is that in fact, um, well, here I flipped a coin, but what does it really mean, right? It means just that if I have a edge with, with zeros uh, at both sides, I can, okay, I just flipped a coin, but it doesn't yet mean anything. I want to find something else that corresponds to this weight. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna say, uh, I find a similar weight here. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, suppose now that I know that this height is zero and I'm running this exploration process, right? I'm kind of walking from the outside to the inside. And in fact, I don't want to know directly the number here, but I want to ask something about its distribution. Well, if it's a zero, then with 50%, I'm going to be red. But I can also just ask the question, am I sort of given one of these colors? And what is the color? Okay, so each edge, kind of gets an extra piece of information. So either it's not excited or it's excited uh, with the value plus, oh, plus one half or it's excited with the value minus one half. So this is kind of yellow and this is red. So now if I discover that, that in fact my edge is excited with probability plus one half, if I just consider this edge, I'm flip symmetric around the height one half, right? Because either I'm zero or one and the two have equal weight. Similarly, if I'm excited with the height minus one half, then I'm flip symmetric around minus one half. Okay, so this in the end is going to lead to flip symmetry around uh, plus one half, okay? They're the edges, yeah. But in fact, okay, in general, things can cross. Okay, so actually I didn't, it's a good point. Um, so in fact, what we did here works on any planar graph. But now let's also use the, uh, the cubic property. Because in fact, if your graph is degree three, obviously you cannot have this, right? because a crossing has four arms. So in fact, when you're on the, on the cubic lattice, what must happen is that if the red and the yellow cluster cross, what must happen is that it crosses like this. Huh? Okay. So intuitively, the, the clusters don't cross at a zero site but rather at a zero edge, okay? Yes. 
So first of all, we want to find something that does not percolate. Okay. So now what is not going to percolate? Well, in the end, I care about this excretion process. I mean, there's some flexibility in the definition. Um, yeah, so I mean, okay. I'm just thinking about what is the best way to present it. Um, basically, if I, if I look at all the edges that the red can go through, like if I follow my red-white percolation, this is not going to percolate. Because now in this case, this particular edge, like if I note it's zero, zero, I flip a coin to decide if it was yellow or red, right? Because we're in this case. So it's, in this case, it's going to be yellow or red. So I think last time what we said was the following. Um, you take hx plus hy plus a coin flip, which is plus or minus one value. Okay? Right, so here I have the height function. And there I have iid plus minus one half, oh, plus minus one coin flips. And I can look at the sign of this function, right? So it's always a half integer. It has a well-defined sign. And what you can see is that this doesn't percolate. So why does it not percolate? If I look at where they equal to, uh, to plus, for example. Well, this set has fkg, right? The height function has fkg. The coin flips, so okay, they also have fkg. You can easily apply this burton keen argument, which tells you that there's at most one infinite cluster, and then you have the symmetry and the phase non-coexistence. Right, so this is clearly symmetric with the, the other one, and therefore there's no percolation. Um, why is it true that um, here it, per it percolates, or in fact it does? I mean, why is there some ambiguity or ambiguity on this thing? Yeah, so I, yeah, that, that's what we, um, took some time to prove last time, but this thing is also ergodic. Yeah, then, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really explain it in detail, but uh, you can, it's also ergodic. Yeah. In general, if you have an ergodic measure and you add IID randomness, then it's still ergodic. Thank you. Okay. So, I mean, now we proved that this doesn't percolate. And now, using the fact that it doesn't percolate, we're going to show that we have uh, the stochastic domination that we want. So what do we want? In the end, we want to find these plus one half boundary conditions. So what do we do? We start from the outside. And we stop when finding Uh, positive height, so strictly positive height, or a plus minus one half excited edge starting from a uh, zero vertex. So for example, suppose that here we find the value minus nine, okay? So we just have a vertex where we have nine minus nine. Then we explore directly its neighbors. Maybe here we find two. So two is good because it's strictly positive. This direction, maybe we find a zero. So now if we have a zero edge, if we want to explore its neighbor, we don't ask directly which number is there. But first we ask, is it excited? And if it's excited, is it plus or minus excited? So in this case, maybe we have bad luck and it turns out that it's uh, not excited. So maybe it's plus two. Okay, but in fact, plus two is good for us. So we stop there. So this one is, uh, it's not excited. 
So then uh, we've, we, yeah, okay, there we go out of the picture, so we don't care. So then here it's minus two, maybe. So we explore the neighbor, maybe it's again zero. So now if we explore in this way, we first ask, is it excited? And it turns out, okay, it's excited, but in fact, it's negatively excited. So it's minus one half the, on the edge. And in that case, we also want to reveal the height here. So we say, okay, the height, uh, yeah, well, it can, it can also be a zero, right? Because when you're negatively excited, you're still allowed to have a high difference of zero. Then at some point, maybe you're gonna find an edge which is positively excited. And at that point, you know that at least this weight on this edge is sort of indifferent between having a zero or a one. So you know that on the next edge, you're gonna have uh, a zero or a plus one, but you don't want to explore its value. And in the end, what this, the fact that this doesn't percolate tells you is that this exploration is going to stop with a good probability before you hit X. Right? So before the zeros, they could allow you to cross. But now when you encounter a zero edge, you can break the symmetry. And the symmetry breaking allows you to chew, well, to, well, to ask if, it, if it's kind of indifferent between zero and one. So what I want to stress here is that this really only works when this bar doesn't exceed the, this weight here, right? Because we want to interpret this as a probability measure if this weight exceeds the bar, then you cannot interpret it as a probability measure because you want this bar and this bar to be of the same height. Right? So this gives an extremely natural condition on the weights, which means that the weight of one needs to be at least half the weight at zero. And you can see that this is clearly achieved when beta is small enough. Right? So you can translate this into a condition on, on V, which is that the logarithm is like its second derivative is uh, not too big. Okay, so when you have these boundary conditions, um, what do you get? Well, of course you look at h minus one half, and again this is going to be dominated by uh, hx minus one half. And then you just do the exa exact same trick as before, right? This is equal to minus hx plus one half. And this has the same distribution as hx plus one half. So you get the contradiction. Are there any particular questions about the delocalization? Okay. So what have we proved? We have basically proved that, um, yeah, well, you can phrase it in many different ways, but we have proved that the variance blows up or even more strongly that this measure is not tight, right? So you cannot really define the limit measure. And in fact, what you can show, so I, we didn't really show this, but it's very easy to see that in fact, the absolute value of x goes to infinity uh, in probability in mu lambda s lambda goes to infinity, uh, yeah, to the whole graph. So why is this true? Well, in fact, using another technique called cluster swapping. So I really don't want to go into cluster swapping, but it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so cluster swapping was invented by Scott Sheffield. And 
you can do many things with it and one thing that you can do is you can see that a, the, the law of hx is uh, log concave in mu lambda and this property also passes to the limit, right? So if you have a distribution which is log concave and flip symmetric and its variance blows up, then it means it's going to be very spread out. And if you're very spread out and asymptotically, of course, this goes to infinity uh, in probability. And I want to derive one more property for this, be, from this because, um, well, we saw before that if you know the law of the absolute value, then you just need to know the signs. These signs are an Ising model where the coupling constants depend on the absolute value. So if you know the absolute value, you know precisely the probability of each outcome, which is an Ising model. But now if, uh, if the absolute value goes to infinity, these coupling constants also go to infinity, which means that you have an infinitely strong Ising model. And what this means is that if I take two vertices, then the sign of the product goes to 1 as lambda goes to infinity. Okay. So if I take two vertices far away, then they're yeah, asymptotically with high probability they're going to have the same sign. Right? Which kind of makes sense. I mean, it just means that you have your surface with numbers and they're going to fluctuate, but still neighbors don't want to be very far away from each other. So like if one of them is very far and positive, then the other one is going to be close. And in particular, they're going to have the same sign. Okay. So this is going to be the input for the for the, yeah, for the BKT transition. Okay. So this is really the height function story. And now we're going to go back to the XY model and see how we can prove that the, the XY model has a phase transition using this last result on the parity, or well, parity, the sign of the, the height function. Are there any questions on this last bit? Yeah. So here you use the fact that beta is small so that you can split the mass on the left and on the right on that drawing that you were erasing? Yeah, exactly. So what you want is that if you have a zero transition, you flip a coin. It gives you the weight, which is the weight of zero divided by two. And you want that the, this weight of divided, yeah, the weight of zero divided by two, that this is smaller than here. Because now what I can say, I can say if I have a transition of one, then the probability that it's yellow is going to be this divided by this. But if the yellow thing exceeds the white, then of course you cannot do that. Yeah, actually, I was thinking about that just now, <laughs> and I don't know. Okay. Maybe you can also do that, but um, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe there's an alternative strategy which is a bit more efficient, but. Uh, No, okay. no. Maybe in some cases it's kind of optimal. So 
it's not uh, clear. Okay. Um, so why are we doing all this? So in the first, uh, yeah, in the first lecture, what we discussed was that <coughs> if you consider the xy model on a graph, like this graph. And what we saw that the partition function of the xy model on this graph was the same as uh, mu of beta of the event uh, that this thing is sourceless. So I'll quickly recall what all this notation means. <coughs> we have our finite graph. And here, mu beta is iid Poisson beta uh, random variables on the directed edges. And yeah, it was not normalized, but not normalized. Okay, of course, we all know what is the normalization constant of, of this thing, but I'll just write it explicitly. Um, the probability that n is equal to some outcome n, this is equal to <coughs> the product over the edges, directed edges of beta to the m x y over m x y factorial. Okay. And what is <coughs> what is this? This is the source function of n. So this is a function which assigns integers to vertices and to a vertex x you just sum uh, the number of outgoing edges minus the number of incoming edges. Yeah. Okay. So here what we're looking at, we're looking kind of at like balance configurations, right? The, at each vertex, the number of incoming and outgoing arrows is the same. So for example, you could have something like this. So one nice way to, to think about the Poisson process is in fact to construct it as a Poisson point process on a larger space. So in fact we're going to see M beta as a Poisson point process on the set of directed edges but times the interval 0 to beta. So the way I think about it is like this. First you kind of draw the graph. Well, we always work with planar graphs, so that's easy. And then you draw this vertical direction. And it means that all the edges here are going to be assigned a height. And the way to assign the height, if you already know how many there are, is simple because it's just uh, you choose uniformly in the height, right? So for example, maybe here you have one edge this way, that way. Uh, right? So I hope this picture is clear. Basically what we did is that we introduced an extra dimension, which is the zero beta interval and we gave every uh, edge randomly a height. Of course, there's a probability zero that you get ties or something like that, right? So this is well defined. Now, yeah, just as a sort of a teaser for the second hour, what is very nice about Poisson point processes is that you can kind of incrementally discover things, right? So if I put a Poisson point process on the line, then what I can do is I can sort of start on the right until I hit maybe my first Poisson point. And then in the remainder, I still know that I have like an independent Poisson point process. 
And what we shall later see here is that here I can also discover information in a nice way. Um, and after discovering, I still know that in the remainder I have some independent randomness. If I conditioned on an event, you know, then maybe the situation is more difficult, but still if I discover things in a nice way, I can still understand the conditioning event after exploring, right? For example, if I know there are, yeah, just an example. If I explore from the right and I know that there are at least four points, if I find one point, then I have independent for some point process, but conditional on having three more points. So you can imagine that here you have something similar. Okay. And what we also discovered was that there's this height function and this height function counts the winding, the total winding of the arrows, right? So the winding of the outer face is always zero. Here it's also zero and here you have one net winding of the arrows around the face. So you have uh, minus one. Yeah, I just used this convention that in this case it's minus one. Right? And you can consistently define this because at each vertex, the number of incoming and outgoing is the same. This is easy to verify. Okay. So, of course, this is not a cubic graph, and the Jew is also not a cubic graph, um, which is kind of bad. So maybe we should change that later. But let's just assume for now that uh, we prove this result on the height function, right? So I take my domain bigger and bigger and I have this result on the sign. Then we're going to deduce some information about the structure of these yellow arrows. Okay. So in this case, um, I'm going to write pi for the random subset of uh, zero beta. And our goal is going to be define a cycle partition of, of pi. So this is really a sort of deterministic procedure, which is really a sort of combinatorial, which yeah, a priori doesn't have a lot to do with the randomness of pi. So how does it work? Well, we're going to take this, uh, this graph and for each vertex, we're going to look at the highest outgoing edge, right? So if I take the highest edge, the highest outgoing edge, then what do I get? Well, this vertex, there's only one outgoing and it's going that way and the same here, right? So we get one like that, one like that. Here, there's no outgoing edge, same here, same here. On this one, the highest outgoing one is that one. I mean, there's only one. So it's the same story as before. Same here, there's only one that's outgoing. Here I have two choices, but they point in the same direction. And here I, I have also two choices. And in this case, I see that this one is higher than that one. So it points in this direction. Okay. So now every vertex has out degree zero or one. And if I follow an edge, then it means that that vertex has in degree one, or at least one. And by my condition, I know that the out degree also has to be one, or uh, at least one, which means that I can kind of keep following those edges until I get into a loop. So this is, I think it's called a cycle rooted forest, right? I have a bunch of cycles and then all the other things are going to go towards the cycle. So here, out degree 
is always uh, less or equal than one. So it's a cycle rooted forest. Okay. So what I can do is I can look at the cycles and remove them. So what happens when you remove a cycle? Well, when you remove a cycle, you're not changing this condition, right? Because here it's about in and out is the same, but every time we remove a cycle, we, uh, yeah, well, we remove uh, degree one from the in and the out, so the thing remains the same. So you can kind of say, okay, uh, this is the first, those are the cycles. Or the, I don't know, cycle roots. So now we define P prime as P minus the, the cycle roots. And then you can iterate. Okay, so after you take away the cycles, you can do this procedure again and then, yeah, uh, well, you get a collection of cycles, right? So in, this, in the end, this gives you a partition of cycles. So let's just quickly do it. What does pi prime look like in this, in this case? Um, yeah. Well, we remove this cycle and, uh, well, there's a cycle there. So the remaining ones are going to be that one. Uh, yeah. That one. Then there's this one, and there's that one. So this one is gone, this one is also gone, and those two are also gone. Okay. So now I iterate my procedure, but clearly there's only one cycle left, which is the one here. So this gives a partition of pi into cycles. And maybe we call the maybe we call the partition, I don't know, maybe we call it psi or something. Okay. Notice also that every cycle has an orientation because, e I mean, it's a cycle, it doesn't hit itself and it's drawn in the plane. So either it's clockwise or it's counterclockwise. So now there's an important lemma. In, we look at this conditional measure. Conditional in uh, on the uh, cycles, so the unoriented cycles in C, the orientations are I I D fair coin flips. So if I, if I would ask you, okay, what are the cycles? Uh, and you would answer and, you, and I would have to give the distribution. I would just have to flip coins for each cycle. So for this, well, we need to check it. How do we check it? Well, we need to kind of show that if we reverse a cycle, we kind of get the same weight for this Poisson point process, okay? So there is a way in which you can 
find an involution of the space which corresponds to switching the direction of the cycle and which, uh, well, preserves the measure, right? So you want to find a measure preserving involution which inverts the cycle and if you can do this, it basically means that you can flip coins. So I want to kind of quickly explain how to do this involution, uh, but I don't want to do it in full detail. So how do you do it? Well, if you take a cycle, then notice that we defined everything in terms of the height as an outgoing, as an outgoing edge, right? So at each vertex, we were looking at the, uh, the outgoing time. So when I reverse this cycle, for example, I want to uh, keep the outgoing times the same at every vertex, right? So if I want to reverse this cycle, I mean, before, first we were taking this cycle, right? The one that, that is now removed. And then the second cycle. So if we reverse the cycle, we don't want to mess up what we did before. So how do we do it? Uh, Yeah, we have the same edges, the orientations are reversed, but the outgoing times remain the same, right? So for example, this one, this edge here, we're going to reverse it, but the outgoing time at this vertex has to remain the same, so we're actually gonna place it at the bottom. This one, uh, yeah, we reverse it, but the outgoing time has to be the same at this vertex, so we're gonna put it a bit higher. Uh, yeah, well, same here. So this one we put very high because this is the outgoing one. And then we do the same. Uh, okay, I hope I didn't make, no, I think it's so good. We reverse this one. Yeah. and then uh, we put in the old ones. Okay. So of course, because you have a cycle, you can, you can sort of reverse the edges, but then you make sure that the outgoing times at each vertex remain the same. And then what you will see is that in this cycle decomposition, if you put everything back, you're gonna decompose it in the same way. I mean, of course, if you have an involution, but you wouldn't preserve the decomposition, then you would be in trouble because it wouldn't be an involution anymore. So it's a little bit more complicated than just reversing the orientations because you have to rematch these activation times. But if you do this, you can work out that this is indeed an involution and uh, it preserves this partition. Okay. So of course, an immediately, immediate corollary of this well, is the following. Well, if I see my cycles and <coughs> I ask about the covariance of, of two points. Then this is of course the expectation in this, in this M measure. 
So let's just write it M beta of the number of cycles around uh, X and Y, right? So why is that? Well, I have my graph and then I have a bunch of cycles. Notice that they can really, they can intersect, but they're really cycles. And now to get the height function, I'm just flipping a coin for each cycle. Well, if it's one way, then it's going to be plus one on the interior. And if it's the other way, minus one. Uh, yeah, of course you decompose in this way. Okay. So it's kind of funny because we, yeah, I mean, we get self-avoiding walks. Well, for example, we know there's SLEs, but now like they can kind of intersect each other. It's not clear. It's also possible, for example, that in the in the limit, they actually don't intersect, right? That they they can microscopically intersect, but in practice they don't. So it's an open question, I think, to ask what happens here. Okay. Um, so what is another corollary? Um, well, the probability that there exists, okay, so well, I completely stopped writing the measure. That's very bad. The probability of the event there exists a cycle around uh, X and Y. This is in the conditional measure, of course. This is larger than this quantity here. So maybe I call this, I don't know. Well, let's just write it. Mu of lambda of the sine of hx, hy. Okay? So why is this the case? Well, let's try to, in, let's try to do this calculation. Okay? Yeah. Well, X and Y are faces, right? So you have the graph. So now the heights are assigned to faces. So maybe here's a face X and there's a face Y. And now I'm measuring the probability that there's a cycle on this thing. So what we see is that if there's no cycle around X and Y, then we're not contributing to this expectation. Because if there's no cycle around X and Y, then their heights are, well, both flip symmetric at the same time, but independently, right? Because we're flipping coins, but all the coins, they, sorry, all the cycles, they don't surround both points. So we're flipping independent coins for the two height functions to arrive at the actual height. And therefore, well, if there's no cycle, then you're not contributing to this event. If there's a cycle, then maybe you're contributing to this event, right? And of course, uh, this is uh, absolutely bounded by, uh, by one as a random variable, right? So, uh, okay, let's do it more formally for a second. I mean, this is bounded by uh, well, okay, let's call this uh, A. Then this is bounded by A plus zero times one minus A, right? I mean, if A doesn't occur, then the contribution to the sign is zero. And if A occurs, then we can just upper bound this by the maximum which is equal to one. Mm -hmm. 
So in this particular case, it's kind of useful to look at this sign. Okay. So actually now we've already proved something very interesting because it means that if I take my system to infinity, then with high probability, if I fix two faces, they're going to be surrounded by a loop. So it means that there are large loops, right? So I fix two faces, uh, x and y. And as I take my domain to infinity, if, if this beta is large on the xy side or small on the height function side, it means that there are going to be those cycles. with high probability. So I think we take a eight minute break maybe, and then uh, in the second hour we're gonna derive the non-exponential decay. Okay, so, okay, we're gonna start. Um, and in the yeah, in the last part of, of this lecture, um, we're going to discuss an object that we haven't really seen before, but which is actually extremely important in all this business, um, which is the bridges Frölli Spencer random walk. So actually, when you look at this Poisson process, um, as we will see very soon, there, there's an underlying random walk. And this random walk allows you to, to compare correlation functions. So, yeah, we already saw that the correlation functions, I mean, when we look at this event, we're looking at a partition function. But you can put other events there and you will get uh, correlation functions. And it turns out that, yeah, Understanding this random walk is very much related to understanding these uh, correlation functions. So before I write any calculations on the board, I just want to say that the calculations, they look quite horrible, but in the end, the, the probabilistic intuition is really quite simple, okay? So I will write down some of the calculations and probably make some mistakes, but the purpose is really to sort of understand the intuition behind these calculations rather than uh, really to focus on the formalism. Okay, so, oh, and there's another side note. Um, Bridges, Freudig and Spencer also found the exact same way to expand uh, correlation functions, but they arrived at, at these uh, expansions in a completely different way. So they kind of looked at it from a very physical perspective. They managed to expand certain determinants and in this determinant, you find random walks. I think maybe it's even the exponential of a matrix or something like that. Um, yeah, so, and in, in, in this thing, uh, in this lecture, we're gonna see the, the bridges Frodi spencer walk directly in terms of this Poisson randomness. Um, and this will also give us a little bit more flexibility in terms of how we define um, our objects, okay? So the most basic observation is that, well, I already drew it before. Um, suppose you have a Poisson point process on a line. So maybe it's from zero to beta. Then, and we never normalize, right? One way to, to, to see this measure is as follows. You explore the, the point which is the most on the right. So of course there are two options. Either the set is empty because there's no point. And in that case, you will explore all the way to the beginning. Right, so this is the Dirac function on the, the empty set. Plus, you integrate from zero to beta. You get a Dirac at the value at which you're looking. And then you get the measure at uh, tau. Right. 
So this is almost the definition of a Poisson point process. Like either you have the empty set or you get an integral for the first point and then in the remainder you have an independent Poisson point process. I mean, you can also see this, for example, as the, uh, the ODE, which defines the exponential, right? I mean, from this, it should be immediately clear that the normalizing constant is going to be e to the beta. Okay, because, okay, if you take the derivative, then you get zero times the thing, and then, okay, this tells you that the initial value is equal to one, right? Because it's a Dirac mass. So now we look at the Poisson point process on, um, yeah, on the graph, right? So this is on uh, e times zero, maybe let's say, yeah, let's say zero to beta. So what we did before in the cycle decomposition is that we said for each vertex, we're going to look at the highest outgoing edge. And now we can do the same. We can say, okay, um, suppose here I have some vertex x, give me the highest outgoing edge. Right, so maybe it's an edge like this. So what this means is that here I'm certain to have nothing. And in the remainder, I'm just a IID Poisson with the, the standard stuff. Okay. So in fact, what we shall do we look at the time function. So the time function is a function from v to, uh, to the positive reals. I'm just going to generalize a bit this function m of beta. Or sorry, it's of course a measure. Um, and m beta, oh, now depends on t. So mt is a Poisson point process on the following set. x t, uh, x, y, tau, such that uh, t of x is, oh, tau is smaller than t of x. So for example, if I put in beta, I'm looking at all directed, yeah, I have a Poisson point process on directed edges whose height is smaller than t x. But now if I explore, then of course I'm kind of lowering this local time, right? So this is called the local time. And in this case, I have the following equation. Um, M of beta is equal to M of beta times the indicator of the complement of X, right? So just like before, this is the event that in fact there's no outgoing edge from X plus zero to beta d tau. There's an edge at tau. Um, and then I have sort of the remaining randomness. So it's beta times indicator of x complement plus tau indicator of x. And of course, we don't just find the time, but we find an outgoing edge. And this oh, works like this. We need to sum over the outgoing edges. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, I explore from the top to the bottom. Either I find nothing. If I find nothing, then I have the same Poisson, but there are no outgoing edges from X. If I find one, then it has some kind of direction. So I sum over which direction it goes. And I have a fresh Poisson point process in the remainder. Okay. So again, everything is non-normalized. This is important. And we're now going to iterate this equation, which makes it look a bit horrible. But in fact, it's really quite a simple uh, procedure. And what we are primarily interested in is, of course, the two-point function. So remember from the first lecture that z of beta 
times the two-point function. This is equal to n of beta times um, d of n is equal to indicator of y minus indicator of x. Okay. And notice also that this gives us a relation for just the two-point function because this is equal to uh, the mass of, of zero. So in the end, we're just looking at the ratio of, of these things. And notice also that in that case, the partition, it doesn't really matter that we didn't normalize, right? Because the normalizations just cancel. Okay. So in this case, maybe this is x and y. We know that there's one more outgoing uh, edge at y than at x. Uh, sorry. There's one more outgoing than incoming at, at y, right? But if we know that there's at least one more outgoing than incoming, we also know there's at least one outgoing. So in fact, when we do this expansion, but we plug in this event, we don't have to worry about this, uh, this, right? Because we're certain that this doesn't contribute. So what we get is the following. Um, sum of z neighbor of y, zero beta uh, d tau. And then we get, uh, well, the indicator that there's this edge times the Poisson point, sorry, this process in the remainder. So this is m times beta one y complement plus tau one y. And this is a measure. And we apply this to this event. Questions? Yeah. What are the objects uh, M, beta, and, and so they are measures? M is a measure, yes. What does it mean to be a computer an integral? Of a measure. Um, well, it just means that this is just a, a measure. And if we want to calculate the expectation of some variable, mm -hmm. we kind of just plug it in. So then it, here we just calculate something, mm -hmm. and then we integrate. Uh, yeah. Why did you do the thing delta and f? Uh, should it be plus? No. So basically what I mean here mm -hmm. is that here an observation of that is just a subset of this, right? Mm -hmm. It's a Poisson point process. Mm -hmm. And here what I'm saying is, I take this set, but I'm just adding this extra edge, right? So basically what I could also do is I could say, okay, M, we have this Poisson measure, but I add this extra edge to the set that I consider. This is just a different way of doing the notation. And here, uh, yeah, here we just have, for example, the empty set. So here it's really a plus. Thanks a lot for this uh, question. I don't know if it clarifies. Uh... Okay. So now here in this picture, um, notice that we have explored what's going on there. So we're certain that this space is vacant, but in the remainder, we still have a fresh Poisson point process, but we're also measuring this event, right? And now the key observation is that at this vertex, we know that it's balanced, right? We know that uh, the incoming and outgoing is the same, but we also know it has one incoming. So what it means is that we can continue this exploration at this vertex, right? We can now say, actually, we're gonna apply the same formula 
but now we're going to apply it at our vertex z. So we explore from the top, maybe we find it straight away, and then we arrive at x. Okay. How to see that in this formula is that, of course, when I look at this measure, I don't know if everyone can see it, then I can actually, I can just remove this edge, right? I know that this edge is there because I have this, I put this Dirac mass. So if I just forget about this thing in the multiplication, I just have to remove the source at y and I put it on z. I mean, this is, the whole thing is equal to z adjacent to y, zero beta, d tau, m, beta, one y complement plus tau indicator at y of the event one z minus one x. Yeah. I really don't know if it's a good idea, but what I'm trying to do here is to sort of explain informally what it means, but also give the, the precise formalism. Um, right? So the fact that I know here that there's an edge from y to z, well, I can also just take it out and encode its effect on the source function in what I'm going to get, right? Yeah. So now what can you do is you can sort of iterate this. You can find another edge which goes out, etc., until you hit x, right? So when you hit x, maybe there's an outgoing edge, but you're not sure. But in any case, when you're at x, z and x are equal, so you get back a partition function, right? So this is equal to the following, uh, sum over omega, which is a path from x to y, and it visits y once, okay? I made a mistake. It's of course from y to x. Visiting x one time. Right? So it's just, yeah. You just follow this procedure until you hit uh, x and then you stop. Then you get some integral. I'll explain it in a second. And then what you get for this remaining thing, this is just going to be x minus x, so it's zero. So it's going to be m of the event dm equals zero. And notice that when we depart from x, uh, sorry, from y, we're sort of diminishing the, the height by a Lebesgue integral, right? We have this Lebesgue integral here. And now every time we, we, we do the same, we get another Lebesgue integral, okay? So in the end, what we're gonna write here is uh, the following. So it's d rho of omega star of tau, uh, sorry, I'll just write capital T. And this is beta minus T. So, okay, I, yeah. I don't want to give the exact definition here, but basically what we're saying is we have this walk omega. So omega star is omega with uh, the last step removed. And rho omega star, this is just one Lebesgue integral for each visit of, uh, yeah, of omega star, right? So for example, in this case, what I, what I just mean here, I mean, t is a random function from v to r, and it just means, well, the first time I was at y, I'm sort of eating through 
the time, and then I go to Z, I'm eating through the time, and then I stop, right? So for example, in this particular case, if this is omega prime, then T would be supported on Y and Z, right? It doesn't eat any of the time at those vertices because it doesn't spend any time there, but it spends time at Y and Z and it kind of eats this time, right? Okay. So now it's really interesting because this looks a lot like a partition function, right? This is actually what we've been doing all the time. And this we can denote, uh, yeah, so it's omega in gamma y x one, d rho omega prime of tau, uh, of z beta, oh, sorry, it's capital T, minus T, okay? So we sum over the paths from y to x, which visit uh, x once, we have this time spent measure, which is a measure which I didn't define, but which is really easy. And then I have this thing, um, yeah, which is the partition function, okay? So I want to say a few things. The first thing is that this really means that all the information of the model is somehow encoded in the partition function. This is really a simple object and this is a priori an object that we don't understand so well. Um, yeah. So I mean, in the end, what we're gonna do is we're still going to use correlation inequalities to have some relations between partition functions and they're gonna help us. Um, yeah. And the second remark is that this is really a sort of a tiny remark, but when we did the expansion of the XY model, we assumed that all the edges had the same correlation strength. But in this one, there's some asymmetry built in, right? Because, um, for example, if I have an edge, if I have an edge like this, if I ate almost all of the local time here, but not so much there, then the edges in one way don't appear with the same intensity as the edges in the other way, okay? But actually this is a problem which is really simple to solve via a gauge transformation. So I'm just gonna quickly show you that because otherwise it's a bit of a like vague thing that. Uh... Okay. So what does this mean? Well, just by definition, we're summing over ends which go from E to uh, Z, such that the thing is equal to zero. And here what we're putting is, we take a product over directed edges, and we put beta minus t of x to the power n x of y over n x y factorial. But now what you can s do you have a It's this, but what you say is the next step, I think. <laughs> so what is essential here is that in fact, we're summing over uh, these balance configurations, right? And this factor is now kind of associated with this edge, uh, which is outgoing from X, but in fact, this is equal to, we sum over N, which have this property, um, where we do square root of beta minus tx, uh, oh, beta minus ty, nxy over nxy factorial. 
So why is this the case? Well, if we just look at how much, how often this factor appears, now we're just counting both when we're incoming and outgoing. So because I put both, I'm kind of counting everything twice. And since we know that incoming and outgoing degree is the same, I know that when I count twice, I'm just counting the sort of the sum of the degrees. So this is like, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's justified that I call it a gauge uh, transformation. And now things are balanced again, which means that sort of everything is happy. And uh, it's, it's really a partition function of an XY model. So this is the partition function of a real, uh, real as in like a existing XY model. Okay. So a priori, it wasn't clear what we got because there was this kind of balancing issue, but now we see that it's really an XY model. Okay. Um, yes. So we have uh, 30 minutes left. So, as mathematicians, we like symmetry. And when we, when we don't have symmetry, we want to find some kind of symmetry, okay? And in fact, we see that here, there's an asymmetry in one place, because actually, oh, there's a, there's a typo, because this should be from y to x, of course. These are the paths from y to x, which visit x only once. So this set is not really symmetric under reversing the path, right? Because, yeah, um, if you visit x once, you may visit y multiple times. So if I replace x and y, then I don't really get the inverse of this set. So what we're going to do next is we're going to actually continue exploring in such a way that we get this symmetry, okay? So how do we explore? Well, we explore as follows we introduce completely arbitrarily a new parameter, which we call, I don't know, maybe we call it uh, alpha. And alpha is going to be between beta and zero. And it's the stopping time. So rather than stopping our exploration as soon as we hit x, we're going to continue our exploration until we hit alpha. So, okay, we explore. Maybe we go there and then hope we explore. We go back and then we explore and we hit alpha. And of course, this also gives me another valid expansion of this two-point function. So the, the, the funny thing with this, uh, with this way of looking at this, this uh, British Scholli Spencer work is that you really can be creative and okay, now I'm going to explore this, now I'm going to explore that, etc. So if you get this, of course, you can make multiple visits to, uh, to the vertex X. Uh, y X. But now I actually want to do something else. I don't want to fix alpha, but rather I also integrate over the value of alpha. Okay? So I integrate it out from the top to bottom. And before, notice that we got one Lebesgue integral at every vertex, except for the last one, because we didn't explore anything there. But now I'm sort of artificially introducing this extra Lebesgue integral um, which I can just absorb in this measure, right? Because we know that the, the walk stops at x. So if I remove the asterisk here, it really means that we're also going to have Lebesgue integral at x. Um, yes, and then we just get the same thing. So this is z of beta minus t, okay? 
So in fact, we see that this, uh, yeah, this definition is much more symmetric because, well, walks from y to x, obviously it's in bijection with walks from x to y. But if I invert the walk, this measure is also invariant under inverting the walk because for this, at each position, the number of Lebesgue integrals is just the number of visits. Okay. So both are invariant under uh, reversing the path. Okay. So there's actually a small mistake here because we did the Lebesgue integral from zero to beta, but we need to also normalize by that. So there's just a factor uh, here, this is equal to one over beta. Okay. So this is, this is in fact an even nicer expansion of the two-point function, at least it's more symmetric. And this is also the result that uh, Bridges, Frodi, Spencer found. Okay. I mean, by the way, their approach does apply in a greater generality to other models. Um, but in this particular model, like this gives you a more flexible approach, for example, because you have this expansion. Okay. So now let's do another expansion. We have our uh, graph. But let's say that we know that the source function is zero. But we're still going to explore from x to the bottom, okay? We have a probability measure and we can look at the probability that this thing hits, uh, hits y, right? It's possible that, that we're going to hit y. So we're really expanding the, the partition function. So z of beta is equal to, um, well, what is it equal to? One over beta times uh, omega in gamma xx, d rho omega t of z of beta minus t. Okay. So what we're writing here is we, again, we put this alpha, we put it randomly somewhere in the interval zero beta. And okay, even though I don't know if there is going to be outgoing edges, I'm just still going to explore until I hit, uh, until I hit this kind of barrier that I found, right? So in this case, uh, I find it here. And when I do that and I, I apply this formula many times, I just get one over beta, which is a normalization, and then I get the paths. Okay. But okay, we can we can look at, at, at this other funny observable, which is z of beta times the probability. that this thing hits, uh, hits y, right? So it's this, this, the exact same thing, but here we're summing over a smaller set. So at this point, this is just a number, okay? So are there any questions about this, uh, this part? No? Okay. So of course, if we have a, uh, a path from x to x, but it visits y, we can decompose it into two pieces where, well, one piece is from x to y and one piece is from y to x. So for example, we can stop the walk the first time that it hits y, and then we continue until we hit x. So this is equal to one over beta 
sum omega in gamma x y, but it visits y only once. And then we have omega prime in gamma y x. Of course, there's no restriction on how many visits. Then we get d rho omega pro, uh, asterisk integral rho omega prime z beta minus t. Okay. So I'm really not, oh, uh, t plus t prime, right? So just to elaborate a bit on this, this walk visits y once, then we cut, and then we have a walk from y to x, and it can make multiple visits. This is just the number of time consumed by the first walk. This is the amount of time consumed by the second walk. And this is just the partition function. Right, so this is really, we're not really doing anything here. Okay. Now, here we have two sums. And actually this sum we can put inside of the first integral, right? So we can just erase that and we just put here sum omega prime in the walks from y to x. But what is this? This is just a two-point function, okay? So this is equal to, I mean, in fact, of course, the, the variable that we integrate over is t prime. So this z beta minus t minus t prime, kind of the, the yeah, sort of the partition function that we're looking at is z of uh, beta, minus t times uh, sigma x, sigma y. But it's not, it's not the original one. It's in, a, it's in an xy model with depleted coupling constants. And then, okay, I, just do, I don't want to really go into details, but there's this, this extra factor which depends on t. This is like a, a gauge transformation. Okay, so I mean, there's some, some extra like thing and you need to think about it. Um, okay. So now, yeah, this is not a constant, which is a bit sad. But uh, we know that, that this is actually because of the Geneva inequality, we know that this quantity is increasing in the coupling constants. If you make the coupling stronger, the two point function is going to increase. So we know that this is in fact smaller than z of beta minus t times sigma x sigma y prime bar beta times, okay, this, uh, this gauge thing, which is nice because, uh, yeah, this, this thing now doesn't really depend on, uh, on t, right? So we're going to continue our calculation. This is 1 over beta sum over paths from x to y, which visit y only once. Integral 
d rho omega star t times z beta minus t times sigma x sigma y bar uh, in beta. Now we're going to do the inequality. Okay. Right, so I replace beta minus t, I just replace it by beta. And I'm just going to cheat and not care about the, the gauge factor. Okay. So there's this kind of gauge factor in the back, but okay. Um, I just. So here we're cheating. Okay. So now, of course, this doesn't really depend on t. So this is a little bit like, uh, well, 1 over beta times the correlation function squared, okay, in beta. I've been told that at the end of the lecture, you're allowed to cheat to save time. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So of course, all the details will be in the lecture notes, which will be finished in five years. Okay. So what do we get? We have this measure and the probability that the loop visits two vertices is upper bounded by the correlation function squared. So obviously this allows us to, to, to lower bound the correlation function between certain points. Okay. So are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. I'm not sure why the one over beta is, is still there. I thought it was so Sorry. First of all, I missed the correlation function. Um, in the end, the, beat, the 1 over beta is going to be good with the, the gauge factor or something like that. So there's this gauge factor. If you work out all the details, these constants are going to cancel. And then you really have the, the two-point function. Okay. So let's put it like this. So there are some cheats somewhere, but the first and the last thing are correct. <laughs> um, yeah. I wish you could write papers like that. It would be very nice. <laughs> So, well, I think it's really nice because we have this uh, underlying object, which is this, this height function, and we have these edges. And in fact, we've seen many ways to kind of connect them. We've seen the, the height function with the absolute value decomposition with the icing model. Then we have the cycle, comp this cycle composition, and then we have the, the bridges froelich spencer walk. And in the last 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to connect this result to the two-point function, which in fact is not going to be so difficult. So what this tells us is that uh, in the measure m beta uh, yeah, conditioned on this event, the probability that y is in omega this is smaller than sigma x, sigma y bar uh, beta squared. Okay. So this is the formula. We, we only canceled the, the partition functions. So this is really exactly the same as what we just did. And what we know is that in this cycle decomposition, the probability of surrounding, okay, now it's a bit tricky because here the x and y are faces, right? But if you take two faces, the probability that you surround 
uh, two phases tends to one as you take the system to infinity. So now what I want to show, this is the last thing, is that in this measure, uh, the, yeah, the probability that y is in omega this is at least one half the probability that there exists a cycle hitting x and y. Okay? So we have kind of two decompositions which are different, but we want to show that if in this BFS walk you're going to hit uh, y when you start from x, then, yeah, uh, you have this uh, cycle. Okay. So this is claim. Are there any questions about this uh, step? So maybe let's first explain why this step implies that you don't have exponential decay. Okay. Now you take two phases. So this is maybe phase U and phase V. And the result on the right tells you that with probability tending to one, there's a cycle surrounding the two phases. Well, this claim tells us that well, if there's a cycle surrounding those two phases, it will hit some of the vertices here, right? So we call this kind of L minus, and we call this L plus. Now, if there is some kind of cycle eta going around, then it must hit like L minus uh, and L plus. So what this gives you is that the sum over x in L minus uh, y in L plus of the square of the correlation this is greater than uh, well the same sum but then you do this uh, this BFS wall. Okay. Notice here that, of course, the starting point we uh, put it in the in the thing. And now this is greater or equal than well one half. Uh, M of beta, there exists a cycle around uh, u and v, and this is uh, one half. So what it means is that basically, if you take u and v very far apart, then this sum is always going to sum to something which is at least one half. Now, if this the case exponentially fast in the distance between x and y then if you take the points from far away, then you're going to converge very fast to zero. Okay. So really the last, the, the very last bit to get that we don't have exponential decay is to prove this relation. Okay. Except that we cheated a lot. Um, yeah, so
basically the way to think about these cycles is that, yeah, well, okay, we already saw it, but they're kind of cycles and, uh, What I first claim, we have this cycle decomposition. We, we took it by sort of looking from the top and picking off the cycles from the top. And what I claim is that the cycles in fact form a partially ordered set, right? So for example, um, this cycle is above this cycle. This cycle is not directly above that one, but this one is above this one because you can compare them at this vertex. And this one is above this one, so it's a partially ordered set. For example, if there was another cycle here, I would have no way to compare those two because they don't hit the same vertex, so I, don't can, I cannot compare them directly, and there's not really a sort of chain of cycles. Uh, so here we call this A, B, C, D. So the set of cycles is A, Set. Uh, and in, in this example, you have A, B, C, and D. Okay. So now you can ask, I'm going to start my exploration somewhere, but now I'm going to do this BFS exploration. I'm going to start at a point and I, I, I stop when I hit alpha. Right, so I have this alpha. What am I going to explore? Well, if I go from the top and I hit my first cycle, this is really like a top cycle, right? There's nothing uh, above it, at least not at this point. So I'm going to follow it until I return to X and then I start consuming time at X again. Then uh, I'm going to continue and I find another cycle. So of course I'm going to start exploring this cycle. So I go there and then there. But when I get here, actually the highest outgoing is not, not this one, but it's this cycle. So first I explore this cycle. But what I kind of know is that because I start my cycle there, this cycle is not going to reach back to there. So uh, oh, I'm going like that and then like that. Okay. So claim um, edges traversed by this BFS is precisely the set of edges in cycles which are uh, stick, yeah, like in this pose set above the point X alpha. In this pose set. Okay, so I kind of, I kind of see my, my alpha, I can see it as a cycle which goes back to itself, which puts it in this pose set. And I look at all the, all the cycles which are above this, this cycle in the pose set, and those are the, the cycles which are going to explore. Okay. So now we're almost there because I mean, basically what this is saying is that if I explore to the bottom, then all my cycles through X are above my, uh, with, above my fake cycle, right? But I'm not exploring to the bottom, I'm just exploring to some random time. And in fact, then the only thing to see is that this whole cycle system is invariant under mapping each time to beta minus the time, right? So this is, this is like another inversion, uh, sorry, involution. So what you can see is when I sort of flip my system in this way, 
it's an invariance of the uh, Poisson randomness, which also preserves this cycle decomposition. So it's an involution preserving uh, the cycle decomposition and the Poisson edges. So under this involution, if I randomly pick my time here, if there's a cycle, then if I randomly pick my time, I have a probability of at least one half of putting the alpha below my cycle. Okay? So that's it. Yeah, so okay, I have two minutes left. Um, yeah, it's very tempting to explain more, but yeah, let me just say, uh, I want to thank the supporting crew for helping here. Um, I want to, uh, yeah, so thanks to them. Thanks to Collège de France for hosting me. And of course, thanks a lot for, uh, for being here. Thank you. <laughs>